I Hate Politics is a podcast about a human activity we love to hate. I am Sunil Dasgupta. In 2016, an MCPS Commission study of its magnet programs called the Metis Report revealed something that was well known already. Black and Latino students were underrepresented in these selective programs, while white and Asian students were markedly overrepresented. The lack of balance was intentional. MCPS magnet programs were initially established to keep white and Asian families in schools going through demographic change. Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring, for example, got its famed math and science magnet and communication arts program at a time when Silver Spring was in the throes of white flight. But times have changed, and the Metis Report was an embarrassment. MCPS proceeded to change its magnet selection rules, including replacing the parent-led application process with something called universal screening where all students would be considered for middle school magnet programs without their parents having to apply. Consequently, the composition of magnet programs began to shift, and one Asian American parent group called the Association for Education Fairness filed a lawsuit alleging discrimination. This suit was dismissed July 29, 2022, by the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland. After the dismissal, I called Janelle Wong, a professor of Asian American politics at the University of Maryland, to help break down what happened. Wong is a board member of Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network, MOCO PAN, which had filed an amicus brief against the arguments of the plaintiffs the Association for Education Fairness. Oh, had I a golden thread and needle so fine I'd band of rainbow design of rainbow design in it I would weave the bravery of if you're new to the show I hate politics is a podcast about our neighborhoods workplaces schools and streets and our local governments as they function in diverse and democratic societies. This means our politics are messy, dirty, sometimes corrupt, with often self-serving politicians. But no matter how much we may hate politics, we are never exempt from it, even when we refuse to participate. In fact, the purpose of politics is to keep society functioning precisely when we don't agree with each other, like now. It is my hope that this podcast will help those who feel left out reconnect in our local communities. Music for this episode comes from Montgomery County Climate Band, The Sunshiners. Kippen Martin on guitar and vocals, Rick Sullivan on vocals and guitar, and Jeffrey Wisner on the double bass. They released their first album, Endangered Species, on the podcast on Earth Day 2022. Washington State is burning up, but 3,000 miles away here in Washington, D.C., it has been glorious. 
in case you are forgetting, Washington, D.C. was a one-time swampland where August used to be the most miserable month, hot and humid and fetid. We are midway through the month, so I guess I should not gloat. August getaways to Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina beaches is a Washington, D.C. area privilege. And if you went to the beach in steamy July, you were lucky. The downside of a coolish 80 degrees in the middle of summer is that it is not enough to warm the ocean in the mid-Atlantic so that it is inviting. Wherever you are, I hope you're finding some downtime before schools reopen. Montgomery County got a grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation as part of the new infrastructure funding authorization to buy 13 hydrogen fuel cell buses for its ride-on fleet together with a hydrogen pumping station in its Gaithersburg maintenance facility. Hydrogen fuel cell technology has largely been a West Coast thing. So Montgomery County is the first public transit to use hydrogen fuel on the East Coast. The grant covers about 50% of what the county will spend on the project, which is about $30 million. In the tale of two library rebuild projects, Chevy Chase and Tacoma Park have been very different experiences. The site for the old Chevy Chase library looks likely to get new development with apartments on top, some affordable as well, while the new library sits underneath. The Tacoma Park Library redevelopment, on the other hand, is proceeding without any consideration of additional affordable or market rate housing. Tacoma Park has not added significant apartment buildings for 40 years now. This is the kind of thing that really upsets people who are on the fence on new housing. Governments can and do impose many regulations, but doing them unfairly gets a lot of people mad and good public policy is held up as a result. Bethesda-based Choquette Chocolates, makers of the chocolate-covered cicadas from 2021, is hiring. Remarkably, their job notice highlighted hiring neurodiverse employees, which is such an incredible thing to see that I thought we should give them a big shout-out. If you know anyone interested in chocolate making, have them go to Choquette Chocolates. It's that time of the year when teachers find themselves buying supplies for their classrooms and for decades now, teachers have spent hundreds of dollars of their own money to buy things they need in their classrooms. The government kindly offers tax breaks for unreimbursed classroom spending instead of making sure that they don't have to spend the money in the first place. In Montgomery County, there's a Facebook group where you can adopt a teacher and help them buy supplies. You can find the link to join the group on the I Hate Politics podcast Facebook page, which you can find by searching for it as IHP Pod. You're listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. I'll be back with University of Maryland Asian American politics professor Janelle Wong. They're calling across the ocean. Yeah, they're calling across the land. And they will till we all come to understand. None of us are free. None of us are free. None of us are free if one of us is chained. None of us are free. There are people still in darkness. Yeah, they just can't see the light. If you don't say it's wrong, then that says it's right. Janelle Wong, welcome to I Hate Politics. So great to be here. I love the podcast. Well, thank you for listening in. Recently... The 
courts dismissed for now a lawsuit that a group of Asian American parents had filed against MCPS uh, around admission policies to uh, magnet programs. Um, what was the origin of that lawsuit? So this is a case that um, has to do with Montgomery County Public Schools uh, selective admissions policies to middle school magnet program. Now, in Montgomery County, Black and Latinx and low-income students have historically faced barriers to accessing these programs and were consistently underrepresented um, in these middle school programs. And why why is that? Because there were um, some processes in place that were really kind of unfair or just not very attuned to access, let's say. So one of these things was all of the um, applications were parent-initiated prior to... Um, 2018. So that meant that really, you know, only the most involved parents were um, preparing the applications and submitting the applications. MCPS switched to something called universal screening. And that's the procedure where all elementary school students would be considered based on their academic record if they qualified and invited to sit for something called the cognitive abilities test. The So what happened after that? It was pretty amazing. The, the number of applicants, the pool of applicants changed from 800 students to 8,000 students. Second, another change was it removed uh, an emphasis on teacher recommendations because teacher recommendations were seen to be susceptible to racial bias, according to social science research. And third, it made a change which considered whether an applicant had an academic peer group at their local school. So it prioritized students who did not have a an academic peer group, a group of students performing at the same high level in their local middle schools. And then finally, it locally normed test scores, the, co uh, the cognitive um, abilities test scores, such that students were compared to others from elementary schools with the same level of poverty. And this made a big difference, these changes in, in increasing access. So that was around 2018. These changes took place between 2018 and 2020. In September of 2020, the Association for Education Fairness, which is a group of Asian American, predominantly Chinese American parents, sued MCPS over these changes, alleging, and this is what's critical here, intentional discrimination against Asian American students in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. AFEF, the Association for Educational Fairness, argued that because these were a limited number of seats, that any change that um, increased the numbers of Black, Latinx, and, and low-income students would necessarily cause a decrease in Asian American students and harm Asian American students. So any attempt to remove barriers to access for Black and Latinx students then would in and of itself constitute intentional discrimination. Now, why is this critical? The changes that I described, those were race neutral, facially race neutral policies, right? If this is not a, an affirmative action case. This is not about race conscious admissions. If these policies were challenged successfully, almost any policy to create more equity, racial equity and socioeconomic equity, if it changed the status quo, would be considered unconstitutional. So civil rights organizations were extremely concerned. And conservative legal activist groups began to salivate. 
this was like a new opening and a new legal strategy for conservative legal organizations. And the group that was representing the Association for Educational Fairness, the group of Asian American parents, is called Pacific Legal Foundation. Pacific Legal Foundation has been in operation since the 1970s. They are a group that originally were Reagan appointees, um, former Reagan appointees in California. And they have been kind of on the conservative vanguard for decades now. Go to their website and take a look at their masthead, their executive leadership for white men. They have then 22 or around, you know, more than 20 um, senior lawyers, the vast majority white. In the last two years, they've added two Asian American lawyers to that group. So that's a very small proportion. This is not an Asian American advocacy organization. This is a conservative, white-led, legal, conservative legal activist organization. And so how do we know that? Because the strategy they're representing this group here, they've also represented group, the, they've brought the same case, kind of case, to Fairfax County and Thomas Jefferson, to Stuyvesant and specialized high schools in New York City, to also now Boston, um, to challenge equity policies in those places. Okay. So uh, let me ask you this. So their main argument is that changing the composition of magnet programs in and of itself is a discriminatory practice. Is intentional discrimination. Okay. Is motivated by racial racial discrimination. Okay. Against Asian Americans. Do they have any other argument? No, this is really an equal protection case. A new area, if it, you know, as it moves through, this is a new area of equal protection law where a group that is um, very well represented proportionally, because we haven't talked about this, but Asian Americans make up the vast, uh, you know, not the vast, but they make up uh, a much greater proportion of those accepted and enrolled in these middle school magnet programs than they do in the county. And so just to add another layer here, that was not the end of the story. After 2020, those reforms were put in place. And then, of course, we all know the pandemic hit. And the school district then changed its policies again. It instituted with regard to these magnet programs, something called the pandemic plan. And the criteria changed again. So now the cr new criteria were that in the face of the pandemic restrictions, there couldn't, they could not administer in any practical way that cognitive abilities test. So they adopted a new system that was a kind of lottery system among students who demonstrated uh, who could meet particular criteria. So for so those criteria were they had to have A's in the relevant subjects. They had to also have scored at least 85 percentile locally normed on the MAP test, which is um, a standardized math test in our district. And so among that group of students, then there was a lottery. It is unclear to me why a certain kid was chosen and another kid was not based simply on external observation. The local norming process is not transparent to, a, to the parent community. The uh, academic peer group issue is not at all transparent <laughs> to yes. uh, to the parent community. So, you know, parents are left. What is wh what is MCPS using here? AFEF, after the pandemic plan was put in place, then challenged the pandemic plan, which, again, is a lottery they, that with a pool of students who have all met particular academic criteria with regard to grades and test scores. 
what you are saying about transparency has been a long time critique of Montgomery County public schools. And those of us who joined in coalition to support the plan and oppose the lawsuit still have many beefs with MCPS. One, the magnet school system is problematic in and of itself. It is. And so we end up, you know, defending a very kind of small group of schools that only benefit a few students that are sort of inequitable in and of themselves. However, keep in mind, this is not only about Montgomery County magnet schools or these four schools. This is about the ability for not just public schools, but public institutions to institute measures to address equity without challenge. Okay. So what did the court say in dismissing their claim right now? Okay. So the court then said there was not evidence that there was intentional discrimination and even further, proper comparison for establishing disparate impact is really comparing the group's representation in the relevant candidate pool and its representation among those who receive offers to the middle schools, right? And the facts show that the lottery process did not have a disparate impact on Asian Americans. Let me go further. So MCPS data showed that Asian American students were about 17% and 13% of the candidate pools in up county and down county regions, Mm -hmm. respectively. But Asian American students were admitted to each of the four middle magnet schools at nearly double those rates. This is in the lottery system, right? They were 30%. Uh, about 30% of the students admitted to, for instance, Clemente and MLK, and also were admitted high proportions in the down county magnets. Black and Latino students, in contrast, were admitted to the magnet schools at lower rates than they appear in the overall population of f- fifth graders. We established that the pool is 17% Asian. Then the lottery acts on top of that pool, right? How do you conduct a lottery that gives you a result that gives you 34% Asian enrollment? I mean, that to me is what people look at that and go, this is, there's something bogus. Okay, it's, that's right. So there are still questions among civil rights organizations about the fairness of the lottery. It is not possible to run a true lottery and get 34% group X when that group is only 17%. That is just not a... F- okay, that, I, I take there that... Is nowhere, yeah. I take that true, that there is... This is not a true lottery. There are still some advantages to Asian Americans in this group. What are those? They're not true lotteries. In fact, in places like... San Francisco with regard to Lowell High School, they call them merit lotteries. If the pool had 34% and then we got lottery that is around 30% or 40% even, right? So give or take some, you know, th- there's a, um, a standard er- a standard deviation of error, right? And, you, you, and, and I, we can work that out. But this is not within any statistical norm. Yeah. So why, are, why does AFEF bring a case that says discrimination? Part of the reason why they feel as if they are done wrong is because the system is so broken that they don't trust it. We can look at the legal documents, but what you're referring to is really MCPS's communication strategies. It's not just the you know telling people what it is, but really what what lottery do you do? What mechanism of lottery do you use that takes a 17% group and turns them into 34%? That is sort of inexplicable to me. Okay, I agree with you. And this is why our group, Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network, along with 
the NAACP, along with Identity, along with Casa de Maryland, we are not necessarily defenders of MCPS. We see ourselves as defenders of equity and racial equity in particular. And so we still have the same critiques of MCPS as you are bringing up. There is not a real commitment to racial equity that has shown itself in results in our district. And that is our position. However, we also think it's very important to support changes that move us closer to equity. And that's what this lawsuit was about. And we were really concerned about the long-term, far-reaching legal strategy. When is the countersuit? Okay. So at the end of August, the AFEF has an opportunity to file an appeal. And with the pro bono representation of the conservative white-led Pacific Legal Foundation, they certain they they probably will, and they'll apply for they will submit an appeal to the Fourth Circuit. Okay, is that when um, a a counter uh, argument will be made? So, because if you can't fix the system itself, right? If, if the if the system we are defending is a flawed system, and we can't fix the system itself, then we are going to continue to have these challenges indefinitely. This is not the single action. This is part of a suite of advocacy efforts that this coalition has engaged in. We are at almost every hearing at, for the Board of Education. We have evidence-based asks for this school district such as hiring more teachers of color, such as making sure, trying to address the problem of the most experienced, most effective teachers being placed disproportionately with white and Asian students over Black and Latinx students. And so this is just one single strand. We are not putting our all our eggs in this basket, and we certainly don't think that this is the bullet. This is a defensive move against a national new legal strategy that uses Asian American students to oppose equity reforms. So Montgomery County is, you know, largely a democratic and at least self-described progressive uh, county, um, you know, but these equity initiatives that should be easiest here are not. And so that, you know, it really raises the question. It's not the fault of the advocacy organizations. It is the fault of people's entrenched commitments to the status quo, including. So, but do you think it's a strategy issue? I don't. I think it is a problem because this is not just Montgomery County. I think we see this nationally. Is there any real commitment among voters? Because that's who it really comes down to, right? To address racial segregation, which is the heart of this problem. In terms of, instead of voter makeup, right? 32% of Montgomery County is foreign born, right? We are a minority majority uh, county for the most part. And yet we can't get it right. That's the issue, right? So it's the it, the juxtaposition is not just how we do compared to other counties, right? It's also the fact the juxtaposition is our makeup is such that it should allow us to do it, but it does not. No, because our makeup, just because we have liberal whites and immigrants in our county does not mean those liberal whites and Immigrants are not moderate Democrats. They are. That's why Hogan is our governor, right? And so there is not a commitment to addressing these structural changes among the school board, among the voters. You know who's pushing for structural changes? Students. And so it was students, student, public school students who pressed MCPS for a structural change. That is to redraw the boundaries, to make 
schools more racially integrated. And that met massive resistance, including from Asian American Democrats in this in this county. Have you done any surveys around this issue? Um, you know, we ask the flip side. So we do a lot our surveys. This is a fairly new issue. I would say it's arisen in the past five years as a sort of hot button issue within Asian American communities. But we do often survey on affirmative action, which is sort of its its cousin, right, in the Asian American community. And what we find is that a majority of Asian American voters since prior really to 2012, but we have been presenting data since 2012, a majority of Asian American voters do support race conscious programs for equity. Now there, you know, and it's, it's like different samples, it's different time periods, and we still find the same thing. There are variations among the Asian American community. So you see Chinese now since 2012, basically the least supportive and but that's still still more support affirmative action than oppose it indian americans have long been the most supportive now indian americans are the majority in montgomery county of the asian american population mm. and we see that you know the the activists who are opposing these equity measures tend to be mostly from my group chinese american so there's definitely variation, but there's overall support for equity. That's why I think it's kind of a an irony that we see um, these activist groups that don't represent the Asian American community opposing equity measures. Okay, so you talk about division within the Asian American community along uh, national origin lines, but uh, I suppose this is also, uh, you know, socioeconomic uh, issues, um, status uh, divisions. What are the breakdowns you are seeing within Asian Americans, particularly? Uh, I don't know if your uh, surveys are focused at all uh, in the Montgomery County uh, or Washington, D.C. region, but you can speak nationally as to what it is. And I suppose it will be similar. Yeah, I think we do see, you know, there is there is regional variation, but what we see in Montgomery County, this is very, I mean, what we see nationally, basically Montgomery County, I think, is like a microcosm of, and one of the most important divisions in the Asian American community is generational and age, and we can see that in Montgomery County, too. So nationally, we see that equity is embraced deeply by those who are the youngest voters, let's say between age 18 and 30. And then those who are older, they are not right wingers. They're much less conservative than white people their age, right? But they tend to be less progressive than the youngest. And in Montgomery County, who is bringing these law- lawsuits and all over the country? It's the parents. The students overwhelmingly support these reforms. And we see students have testified and students were part of providing testimony in support of reforms, Asian American students in Montgomery County too. It isn't clear as a pathway as to how we can actually bring the real reform that will you know, bring about the changes that I think it's, in Montgomery County, there is broad agreement, I think, on equity, but no movement on it. So you know public opinion data, right? It's There is often broad agreement on principles of equity. But when it comes to specific policies, you get into that kind of NIMBY and zero-sum kind of politics. Now, I will give a shout out, you may not agree with me, to the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity, which developed a data-informed set of asks, some of which I mentioned, such as hiring more teachers of color, such as providing uh, and recruiting teachers into the schools, effective teachers into the schools that need um, need those teachers most, such as 
ensuring that rigorous coursework is available to all students and not um, screened uh, by teachers, but instead that there's more of a universal approach to it. And hundreds, I went to a forum three years ago where the Black and Brown Coalition gathered, I don't know if you were there, but gathered almost a thousand parents. Oh, These were immig- Okay, so do you remember that? And they asked those school board members to commit to those asks, and the school board members all said yes. And, and nothing happened. Nothing has happened. Exactly. Correct, but That's that my is the point. Right? That is people power. There is resistance. Now we're looking at a school board likely in the future, you know, that is now infused with some even more um, levers of resistance because now there are people who are agitating around teaching race in our school district, et cetera. So, well, so the argument is not about, you know, you know, who sort of Asian Americans getting more than being overrepresented in um, educational institutions, though I think practically that's what it is, right? I think the argument is about transparency, about having a public understanding of the processes so that they are considered legitimate. Government is, I think the fundamental task of government is to be legitimate. If they if they if they lose legitimacy, then they don't have consent to 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 uh, rule. Okay. So I think yes, that was the problem. The, with that's the broader context here. Why why are they facing a lawsuit from AFEF? Because they have not been transparent with the Asian American community about or other parents or anybody, about what is happening. Or anybody. Yeah. <laughs> now that is also an ask <laughs> of the Black and Brown Coalition to develop much better communication with communities of color. Again, you know, it, we haven't seen it come to fruition. I'm not seeing an easy answer here, even among the two of us. Janelle Wong, thank you for coming on I Hit Politics, and I hope you'll be back if you find an easier answer. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Yes, my daddy was a miner I'm gonna be a sunshiner My granddaddy was a miner I'm gonna be a sunshiner Ever since they closed the mine Ain't too much to do with your time Except wash your clothes in the crick and fold the flannel Till the gal come along with that solar panel Yes, my daddy was a miner What lessons can we draw from my conversation with University of Maryland Asian American politics professor Janelle Wong? First, the lawsuit against MCPS admission rules for middle school magnet programs was indeed a unique equal protection argument where any change in the status quo was argued to be a prima facie case of discrimination, even if the pre-existing conditions were discriminatory themselves. The district court ruled that MCPS's lottery system was a facially neutral method for allocating students to limited middle school magnet seats and further observed that the results of the lottery continue to overrepresent Asian families. The case is likely to be appealed to the Fourth Circuit. A strategy of conservative groups with the Supreme Court now packed with conservative justices, is to find legal basis to continue to push lawsuits up until they reach the highest court. Whether this case will do that, we don't know yet. Second, quite apart from the legal arguments back and forth, is the debate about how MCPS manages its magnet programs. The battle over middle school magnet programs 
should not cloud the fact that same problems exist in elementary and high school magnets as well. The structural problems are clear. There are too few magnet seats, and those who make the threshold but are left behind in the lottery are not served with enriched programming. That is a problem MCPS needs to figure out. But MCPS is also dealing with widening achievement gap, especially after the pandemic. To address both overachieving magnet-ready students and underperforming students is a hard problem to resolve. And there are no signs that MCPS or the Montgomery County Board of Education have any viable plan to address the problem. Third, this is particularly a problem because it isn't clear how the lottery works. As Janelle Wong points out, the pool of students eligible for middle school magnet programs is 17% Asian in the up county and 13% Asian in the down county, which is consistent with the general Asian American population in the county itself. But the lottery somehow yields 34 and 30% Asian American students in up county and down county respectively. This is only possible if other selection criteria are somehow inserted into the lottery. This could be the result of norming the cognitive ability scores or cohorting in home schools, but it isn't clear how. This isn't just a communication problem for MCPS, but one of legitimacy itself. The results may favor Asian American groups, but if the process is fuzzy, all kinds of malintent will be associated with it. There is also the question of when there may be a countersuit by black and Latino groups to ensure appropriate representation within the lottery system. Fourth, there are many purely lottery magnets in MCPS. Lloydeman Middle School for the Performing Arts, the best known among them. Lorderman is not just a lottery magnet, but an all-school magnet. No matter who goes there, students selected by lottery or students for whom Lorderman is their home school, everyone is eligible for all the classes. Selective magnets, even if they admit students by lottery, are close to students attending as their home school. Removing magnet cohorting and opening all magnet classes to the entire school essentially ends one logic of the magnet programs themselves. And here we return to the structural question of whether the best use of MCPS resources is to focus on homeschools rather than building more schools within schools, which eventually become demographically unbalanced. That's all for this episode. You've been listening to I Hate Politics. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. Music for this episode comes from the Montgomery County Climate Band, The Sunshiners. Kippen Martin on guitar and vocals, Rick Sullivan on vocals and guitar, and Jeffrey Wisner on the double bass. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone else who might want to, please email us at ihppod at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at IHP Pod. I hope you'll subscribe and share the show as we bring you stories about politics close to you and to your home. See you coming. next time. We know it's close at hand. Our mother, she is pleading. I've had all I can stand. Rivers of oil, blood and tears, darkest evil, deepest fears, Exxon Mobil and their friends, this web of lies they defend. Truth, time is coming. No, it's close at hand.
Our mother, she is pleading. I've had all I can stand. Their own dark warnings they would not heed. They took the money, they chose the greed. They pumped that oil into the skies. They filled our heads with their lies. The truth, time is coming. We know it's close at hand. Our mother.